three, two, one, go. Level up, level up. Welcome to Real Talk TV. My name is Roger Henry. I'm your host for this week's Christmas special, and I've got the pleasure of having Isin Francis Watson from the Kaya Project and Karen Thompson from Helping Kids Achieve. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm so pleased to have you on the show, um, especially this time of the year. Congratulations to yourself as well, Karen, on the birth of your son. I've seen all the images. How, how are you managing at night then? Is he sleeping well? Yeah, yeah, he's a really well behaved little kid. Um, he, he hardly cries, the only time he cries is when he's hungry um, and all from that he's really happy. So Sounds yeah. like my type of child to be fair. <laughs> I only cry when I'm hungry. And <laughs> Isim, talking about food, mm. you've been doing some amazing work in the community. I mean, it's all over Nottingham, the work that you're doing. I know right now there's lots of people facing austerity, but you're going beyond. I mean, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment. Okay, um, back in March, um, we realised that with the first lockdown, quite a lot of our service users were struggling um, to make ends meet because the children were at home and, you know, it was just really hard. So we decided we'd make 30 meals and for our service users. Word got out and then agencies started contacting us, you know, um, to support with meals for their service users as well. So um, it's just grown and grown, and um, it's been it's been a blessing because other you know retailers have offered to give us stuff like Meat and Co. Um, we've got a, a chef who's worked for the RAF, and he's coming in to help us cook as well. Um, the Man Food Bank has been supplying us with vegetables and some stock um, staple for food bank. It's been amazing. I've, we've all worked together and at the moment, last week we produced over 230 meals. Wow, that's a lot of work to, to prepare. Mm -hmm. So Karen, I mean, you're working with the younger end. Yeah. You know, those kids are at school. I mean, do they share that, that they're not eating regular meals with you? Um, no, not necessarily. No, they don't. But um, what I do see is that so that like, they won't necessarily say it but like they'll kind of show it in different ways and say that like they um like they want to go to the sh shop or something to like get get something to eat so it's not necessarily that like, saying i'm i'm hungry like um feed me or well, i ain't got no food at home you know what i mean it's just like they they show it in different ways and in terms of like them saying that they want food because a lot of the times it's it's pride. Yeah, I was going to say pride. I mean, the thing is as well, who's going to actually put their hand up and say, look, I've not eaten for days, you know, so real difficult. So how do you work with those youngsters then to kind of draw that, that out of them, that they, you know, that they are hungry and you've got to kind of support them with taking them to the shop? I mean, is that money out of your own personal funding or is that out of your own pocket? How does it work? Yeah, so um, we've been given um, some money from the lottery to wow, do okay. some outreach work with young people. Um, and we've also been given money by uh, Street Games, which is a national charity to do one-to-one -one mentoring with young people. So out of that budget, um, we'll take young people to like, Subway um, to get something to eat or um, like we'll, we'll go to Tesco's and like, they can pick like, stuff that they want to eat and like, take home. I mean, um, one of the young people, he, <laughs> with his budget, actually went to Tesco and bought some food for his mum as well. Wow. Um, so then that kind of shows me like the, the home situation that's going off there so then I can make sure that I give them extra support and bring in other organisations that can work with them so then like they've got something then to kind of fall back on. So we've seen nationally the work that Marcus Rashford's been doing over the last few months. How do you feel about that? Yeah what well, I feel like what he's doing is using his platform as a high profile footballer um, to raise attention to like young people and child deprivation and making sure that these young people are fed during the summer holidays and after that um, which I think is 
amazing um, as there's not a lot of high profile footballers that do that kind of thing and so I'm hoping that it kind of trickles down into like the the community and other people like step up and so forms a trend. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. And I think, but not just necessarily footballers. Though. Surely there's got to be lots of people out there who are making lots of money who could actually support this cause as well. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh no, one hundred percent. I mean, um, there's a lot of people that you will see on like social media um, flaunting how much money that they've got, but like we don't necessarily see what they're. Um, what they're doing in the community to benefit that the communities that they come from because a lot of these um, high profile celebrities whether it be like footballers, actors or whoever um, they, they've, they've all come from deprived, a lot of them have come from deprived backgrounds mm -hmm. but like you don't see them actually putting the money back and their resources back into the community which I, I'm hoping um, them seeing Marcus Rashford do that, then they'll carry on to do that as well. So having run your project for over 20 years and three years, tell me about financially the most difficult times, you know, those times where you've had to put your hand in your own pocket, you know, to be able to provide for your kind of service users. How have you managed to do that? Yeah, so for me, I started off um, selling wristbands in the city centre. Um, and setting up GoFundMe pages um, and using my own income from work, a lot of my own income from work, to um, buy sports equipment and buy stuff for the young people and to pay for whole hire. Um, and so it was, it was really hard in terms of like self-sacrificing um, where I would, I would go without. I, I, I wouldn't have like any food in my fridge or anything like that. So like literally I was living off like, meal deals and things like that to make sure that the young people had a good time and I could provide a service for them. So it was, it was hard, um, but I was just like determined to get to a point where I didn't necessarily have to do that no more. And so, yeah, it, it kind of, it's kind of grown from there, but it, it, it was hard. Um, well, that's the sacrifice and the commitment that has took you to this amazing place in such a short period of time. You know, you've, you're the national, well, you were the East Midlands unsung hero. You then went on to the national awards where you won. Um, let's just have a quick look at that. The winner is, Karen Thompson. I'm sure you'd like to say a few words. Right. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to my mom for believing in me. She's been with me from the start. Um, secondly, I want to thank my volunteers. We've got one of them in the audience tonight, Eli, um, Darren, Nico, Aaron. Uh, I also want to thank all my young volunteers, my, my young leaders. Um, what they're doing is amazing and they're setting an example for the younger kids below them. So, yeah, I also want to thank all the young people that come to our sessions, because without them, really, it wouldn't be nothing, you know? So, I just want to thank all the young, young people. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to thank all the parents as well that bring their young people down to my sessions as well because what they what they do is amazing as well so yeah thank you congratulations brilliant please show your appreciation one more time for our unsung hero champion kieran thompson and our world sports star of the year Ayla Kipchoge. Just tell me, Karen, how did that feel in that moment, receiving that award? In fact, let's go back just to the localised. 
Yeah. Because I remember seeing you in tears. Yeah. So um, I remember when I got a phone call to say that they they're going to nominate me, and I thought that's that's very nice of them. At the time, I was in a meeting, and I believe you heard some views in that meeting as well. And so, like, I, I nipped out of the room when I got a phone call and said that they nominated me. Um, I was like, oh, that's that's very nice of him, but I didn't really think anything of it because I thought there's hundreds of people that get nominated for that award every year by me. <laughs> Out of the whole East Midlands, mm -hmm. there's amazing people doing a lot of things in the community. Why are they going to pick me? And then um, a few days later, I got another phone call to say that I had been selected as the top three finalists in the East Midlands. And so then that was a, that was a massive shock once again. And then um, they said that they were gonna come out and do like a video um, with me um, about what I do at the club. And then they came out and they surprised me on the Friday um, with the trophy, which was, yeah, it was just out of this world because as, as I said in the VT, um, like, I don't do it for any awards or like any recognition. It's just to solely help and support these young people, mm -hmm. um, which I really care passionately about. Um, like, I've been working with young people for 13 years. Um, and like, I just want to make sure that they are looked after the best possible way and like they they have like the proper support in place for them and that's that's what I care about so like for me to win that award was massive as like it was a real unsung story because I've never won an award before in my life like not at school not anywhere else so like that was my first trophy so that was like feel like that was a lot of emotion like coming out like oh you wow yeah like i've actually been recognized for something that i've done you know um, and then so. you went on to the national which everybody saw i mean you know ten thousand people you know 15 people that, that were in that final yeah and then your name was called out yeah how did that feel that was a very very surreal moment i mean um standing there. I felt like I was on the X Factor <laughs> um, and like seeing like royalty like Princess Anne and like all these amazing sports stars and celebrities all applauding me and then like seeing like Gary Lineker and like the world <laughs> record holder for the marathon giving my trophy it was it was a very surreal moment. So like, what was his name? I can't even pronounce his Try. name. Um, Chariot Kipchoge. Okay. Um, so That's a good attempt. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I know he's from Kenya. He's the world record holder for the marathon in the uh, first month to go under two hours. Um, so I'm a big athletics fan as well. Brilliant. And so like for him to give me the award, that was extra special. So yeah, that was, that was amazing. So yeah, it it kind of can spurred me on to now like I can do this and I can do more for the young people in the community because it's gave, given me a bigger platform now to work and support other young people that I may not necessarily have been able to work with before. Um, and so I've been invited to things like the Youth Sports Trust um, conference where I got to speak in front of hundreds of teachers about how best to support young people from inner city backgrounds. Um, I've been invited to um, award shows to give out awards, which was like, again, surreal in itself, like little old me giving out awards to other amazing people that are doing great stuff in the community. And, so, and, and I believe the B Blue Peter, what's that all about? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so. Um, we all remember Blue Peter. Yeah, this is it. So actually at the awards, um, I saw them, um, I saw one of the presenters um, presenting and I, at first, I didn't even know it was a um, presenter. Like I just saw a Blue Peter badge and I was like, 
oh, I want one of them. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I'm a presenter. Wow. And I was like, oh, I, um, I'd love to get my kids on the show. And she said, um, well, my director's somewhere about, um, like, I can put you in contact with him. And so, like, she went and found him, um, spoke to him and said, I want to get my kids on the show. Um, and he was like, he gave me his number and it just went from there. Amazing. Yeah. And just to touch on ISIF, because you've not received an award, but what you do is something else because I've been privileged to go out in the community with you. You know, um, the work that you do is not just for the elders, which is what has been depicted on Real Talk TV on, on several mm -hmm. uh, different shows, but that other stuff. I mean, you're, you are an unsung hero and there's so many others out there. But the one story that really grips me more than anything is you walking around the streets in the early hours of the morning with your outreach workers actually taking knives mm. off people. And I remember one particular story, you had the knife and you couldn't get rid of it because the police station wasn't open. Mm. I mean, who does that? I'm a mother first and foremost and, you know, for me, I want my children to be safe and if my children are safe I want their friends to be safe also and so for me I don't look at I'm not doing this for recognition like Karen says or for accolades I'm doing this because this is me you know and I care for not just the elders but the children as well because I always think they're our tomorrows and if we don't show them love and care now they're gonna grow up and they're gonna spiral so for me, it's to be with them while they're young and going out on the streets, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning, you see 13 year olds mm. out there. Why are they out there? You know, and the question we don't ask them is what, what are you doing out here is, are you okay? Mm. You know, have you had something to eat? If it's the winter, are you cold? You know, um, and you know, if we, is there anywhere to, we, I always have food. I always have food and so, get them in the car, give them something warm to eat, you know, something on them and find out where they live or a safe place we can take them. Mm. Um, with knives, yeah, there's quite a few young people we come up against that have knives of different sizes and shapes um, and we do take the knives off them. Um, one particular night we took her, the blade was that long, off a young man and we did we, couldn't take that back to the office because, you know, so we went to the police station and I stood outside and I waved with the knife. I shouted, I called through the little yellow telephone. You know, we were there for over an hour. We had to ring somebody else from another agency who rang the police, who opened the door to let us in. And they let us in and they walked away and left us with the blade. So for me, you know, it's safety first and, you know, being a grandma, I wouldn't want to know that something's happened to one of my grandchildren and you know Karen's doing the same we just want our young people to grow up with love mm -hmm. you know and have a safe place to come to or you know a number to call and say I, mean, I need help you know there are a lot a lot of agencies out there and I'm not knocking anyone but I think we've made ourselves available you know not just Monday to Friday nine to five and I think young people are seeing that and they want, you know, they're not out of bed, some of them, <laughs> until four o'clock in the afternoon. There is nowhere for them to go. So for me, it's being available and not just for me to say, what's going on, whatever. Let them speak to me, you know, mm. and once they've spoken, um, let them get it off their chest, give them something to eat, you know, and respect them for who they are doesn't matter whether they've come from a deprived area or they've come from them affluent areas. Respect them for who they are. They're a young person or an elder that's got a need and that's what we're about. Well, I don't mean to cut you, but you know, time's ticking. I want to say a special thank you for attending this Christmas special. Um, really grateful to, to both of you as my unsung heroes and so many others as well. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and a very prosperous New Year. And I'd like to say to our viewers, thank you for joining us for this Christmas special. And uh, I wish you all a Happy New Year. 
Real talk, real people, real problems, real solutions. Thank you.